Welcome back to eLiterate TV. I'm Michael Feldstein, and I'm here with Simon Buckingham Shum of Open University in the UK. Welcome to eLiterate. Hi, thanks. So you do research on understanding and analyzing student writing and, and, and participation in online discussions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that research looks like and what you're trying to do? So we're interested in, in two things, really. One is, the, the big question is, how do you understand what the depth of learning is that's going on? Okay, so how do we go beyond really basic figures like there were 523 posts today and you replied to five different people? That's, that's about the level of analytics we have right now that tells you what's going on in discussion. So we're really interested in getting at what was the quality of your contribution? Um, and um, are you, do you seem to be taking on board uh, other people's perspectives? Um, we're also really interested in how well um, a student is willing to be stretched and challenged out of their comfort zone, for example, which is really important for learning. Otherwise, really, they don't make any progress. So that's what we call dispositions for learning. So you're, you're trying to do this with software. Can you give us some idea of what kinds of cues the software is looking for in order to tell whether a student is being stretched or being, is willing to be stretched? What we're trying to figure out is whether for example, if you are um, resilient, then you might persistently have a go at a problem. Um, and uh, if you're resourceful, that when you get stuck and you don't know what to do, you still know, you still have strategies for, sol for, for moving forward and don't just get stuck. You might uh, go and consult a, a forum and ask what's going on. You might watch a related video that's been recommended to you that suggests you're you're willing to take advice from someone else. So we're interested in those kinds of, um, those qualities, which show that someone is willing to not just give up. Um, we all know that not just, not just kids, but adults, some of them are quite risk averse. Um, you know, when they, when they get the feeling that they're never gonna learn this, they just panic, right? And you have to help a learner get through that sort of panicky stage and, and build their qualities and their, their competencies to deal with that. So we're looking at how software could pick up on traces such as these, what some people call 21st century competencies, that they're resilient, that they, they know how to make use of their peers when they're stuck, that they're curious and, 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 and want to dig deeper, right? And, and so the, the challenge is, could the software pick up evidence from the traces that you leave behind as a learner that you're engaged in some of these uh, activities, because these are the things that employers care about as well. So you work at Open University, which has been doing online learning long before MOOC was ever a word. Mm -hmm. And I assume that you're using this uh, uh, technology in that context, in a non-massive online context. Yeah. What do you expect to be able to do in that context with the information that you hope your software can detect? So right, so at the OU we've been doing distance learning for 40 years. Um, and for many of those, it, it had an online component. Of course, things have moved on. Um, and so many of the techniques that are now being applied to MOOC data have been developed for online learning more generally. And many of the lessons and mistakes that are being made in the world of MOOCs are actually quite well known in the world of online learning. But everybody is so new to it that they're just learning very fast there. So we've been you know, analyzing, for example, chat transcripts. You know, we have a webinar, we analyze the chat that's going on. Mm -hmm. But if you had a two hour webinar, you wouldn't want to necessarily read everything in that chat because there's all sorts of, you know, superficial stuff going on. But we've been trying to see, well, can we, can we train a machine to spot where some really meaningful exchanges took place? Mm. And if that corresponded to the point where the speaker, for example, was trying to provoke discussion and debate, then that's a good sign. If, if, if nothing really seemed to happen when they did that, that might be a warning sign, mm. for example. You know, if you have a, uh, you've got a very busy learning mentor at, you know, at the Open University, each mentor is looking after, you know, perhaps a group of 20 students, where should they put their scarce attention hmm. most? And um, when you then scale that up massively to MOOCs, clearly we can't have human beings in there providing that level of personal attention that we know that students need and value. So there's a real opportunity for, for some of these analytics software hmm to come in and give personalized feedback. So uh, clearly the problem that you're addressing in, uh, in a traditional online program where you have stretched uh, support 
people and stretched faculty gets exacerbated in, in a MOOC. You can see the continuum mm. there. That's right. What's different in the MOOC context? What's new that you have to grapple with as a researcher in that environment? One of the risks that MOOCs run is that because they're trying to do it at massive scale and include some assessment, right, because everybody wants to know how am I doing, and they may even want to prove at the end that they did well. The problem is when you scale it up massively, how are you going to do really meaningful assessment at massive scale? Mm. Now, one answer is, well, we'll just measure the stuff that's easiest to measure. It's like multiple choice quizzes and so forth. But that only tests certain kinds of things. So I think there's, there's a huge opportunity for MOOCs to try and learn how to give authentic assessments, right, where you, you actually get students and learners doing real projects, making real stuff, sharing their designs, sharing their work. But that's deeper and more complex learning. So how on earth do you assess that at scale, mm. right? And there are various answers to that. Maybe we just need to recruit armies of mentors who, you know, that may be a whole new career, right? That I mentor MOOCs, you know? Um, maybe peers can assess each other to some extent, but we know that that's not perfect. Although there's some, there's some quite interesting results that show that students can actually assess as well as an expert in some areas. And then there's the opportunity for, for analytics. Now, one of the really exciting things, I think, about MOOCs is the huge amount of data. Because when you're trying to train a computer what good looks like, the more data you've got, the better. Mm. So now, for the first time, it's like an educational technologist's uh, dream come true. You have a 24-7 platform generating huge amounts of data of real students doing real learning. It's a completely different order of magnitude from a tiny little experiment with a few people doing this, you know, which is, it's, which is like toy stuff compared. So now, for the first time, we're sitting on massive data sets to train machines on, mm. which reduces error to some extent. So let's talk about those massive data sets, because I think there is a lot of uh, hope and to a certain degree hype that now that we can see so much data on student learning, that suddenly we'll have these magic insights into uh, uh, how students learn and we just point the machine at that data set and somehow we'll have the magic <laughs> formula. right? Yep. What's still hard about doing this sort of research, even with that data? And what new problems does having that massive data set uh, raise for you? Well, I think there's, there's technical problems and there's ethical problems. Um, and um, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, you, you hear a lot of rhetoric that let the data will speak, right? So rule number one is the data doesn't speak for itself, right? Somebody's decided what to capture and what to ignore. Somebody may have cleaned the data, but what have they lost in the process? Somebody has decided to how to visualize and render that data in some way. And they made all sorts of decisions about what you should or shouldn't see, right? You know, a bad visualization can be incredibly misleading. Mm. So, you know, one of the really important issues that people need to wake up to, I think, is that the data is not speaking for itself. It needs people who are making decisions all the time about what to capture, what not to capture, and how to render it. So there's a real interesting challenge there for teaching faculty how to read this stuff. It's like a new way of reading and writing. It's a new literacy. And that's, that's a real interesting area for development. And of course, there will be early adopters who are really data hungry and want to know how they're doing as, as educators and will learn how to read and write these, these kinds of visualizations. Obviously, there's ethical issues around you know, Big Brother watching you more and more. And at the moment, all we do is capture things like clicks. Right, and, and, and on contributions online. But the fact that we'll soon be able to you know, buy stuff that you can plug into your body, capture biometric data, people, you know, uh, the whole sort of what's called the quantified self movement is going to generate another huge explosion of data which might get synced up with what you're doing on a given MOOC. Right? So then we'll have, even, we'll have even more information which you might choose to share from your personal cloud. Uh, uh, in order to gain ma more insight into your, into your learning. So that's kind of exciting and scary as well. And then finally, there are some really interesting challenges around, you know, for example, it's, it's very hard to anonymize certain kinds of data. So you, know, you can strip out the names and so forth, but there have been some quite scary cases which show that people who thought they had anonymized data, actually they can people can still figure out who they are. Mm. So there are some interesting challenges there as well. Um, but you know, I, look on, I try to look on the positives there. There's huge amounts of data to learn from. 
uh, and we've never had anything like this before, really, ever. Mm. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Well, it seems like we've got a lot uh, that we're going to learn ahead of us. Uh, so Simon Buckingham, Sean, I look forward to learning from you in the next year. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks.